Hey guys, this is Miss Gray, and today I have Miss Mel Holland with us, and we're going to talk about um, Unit Five: The Behavior of Gases. We're going to start with pressure. How's that sound to you? Sounds good. All right, let's get to going. First of all, we're going to define what pressure is. That's a good place to start if we're going to talk about pressure. Um, pressure describes a force that's acting on a given area. Like if I push you, that's pressure. Yeah. So we need an area, like some surface, right? And then we have particles that bombard this area. That creates pressure. If you don't have any area to collide against, you won't have any pressure. This is pretty simple, right? So this is what happens in a gas. The gas molecules would fill up a container because they're going to move throughout the entire space. So if we don't close it, they'll just bounce right out and the whole container that they'll fill up is the room that we're in. So if you put a lid on it, they'll fill the container, and they move around and they hit the sides of the container and those collisions create the force that we talked about when we said that pressure is the force per unit area. Then that's what we're talking about, that force is created by the collisions with the sides of the container. And of course, the container has an area for the force to act upon. That's what creates the pressure. Let's go and see this in actions. Okay, so here's an example of a container. It's just a box. And in order for us to have any pressure, we've got to put some molecules inside. So now we have molecules of gas, and notice how they're going to bump around and collide into one another until they fill up the whole space. Right? Random movements of gas particles, um, generally speaking, at normal temperature and pressure, they're moving about 500 meters per second. That's so, pretty fast. Yeah. So, of course, hitting the sides of the container creates pressure. The more collisions with the side of the container, the more pressure we get. So, can you think of a way that we could get more collisions? Hmm. Well, you could make the, the container smaller. Okay, let's try that. Make the container smaller, and there's more collisions, and the gas seems to be moving faster now, too, right? Yeah, because when they hit something, they have to bounce a different direction. So then the temperature has gone up and the pressure has doubled. Wow. Yeah. Is there any other way we could get more collisions? Well, let's see. If we, uh, if we heat something up, it might move a little faster. Okay. And just like kids in the hallway, if they're moving faster, there's a better chance for a collision. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. So, yeah, it looks like we have... Higher pressure again, now it's um, more than doubled what it was originally, so we're at 0.5 atmospheres, 0.6, so I'm reading the dial to see what's the pressure. All right, there's one more way that we could get more collisions here, so let me put our gas back in, let it diffuse through the container. All right, so we're pretty evenly spread out now at 0.2725 atmospheres. All right, so how else can we get more collisions? Well, we could always add some more. Sure, if we put more particles in there, we'll get more collisions. Is that kind of like a balloon? Mm -hmm. The more you blow into it, the more, the more pressure that you're, you're causing on the surface of the inside of the balloon. Right, and since the balloon is a flexible container, it can expand. This one is not very flexible, and it's not going to expand, but we can blow it up, right? blast the lid right off. I think that's the most fun part of this simulation. Absolutely. Yeah, let's add more heat. That little guy struggling. Yep, look at our thermometer. There we go. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> and hey, look, the temperature and pressure is dropping dramatically because now we have way less collisions with the sides of the container since now the container's open. What we would do to measure pressure is to let particles of air collide with a pool of mercury and so we have like a bunch of air particles that just they'll randomly go in any direction but some of them are going to hit this pool of mercury and that forces the mercury up into a narrow tube in the barometers and then we mark the sides. It's pretty common in the weather industry to have this atmospheric pressure of 29.92 inches at sea level but this is science class, and so rather than talking about inches, we're going to talk about millimeters of mercury. That's a metric unit for measuring pressure, and that simply comes from measuring how high the mercury rises in this narrow blast tube. 
millimeters of mercury. And 760 millimeters of mercury is a typical um, one atmosphere that's considered standard pressure because that's the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level. So let's talk about these units that I mentioned. Somehow I just toggled off of the application I needed. So. All right, so the units of pressure that I just mentioned are millimeters of mercury, which is equal to um, one atmosphere, no, nope, 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. There's my pen. I don't want my pen. And there's another unit that's commonly used, but it's not a metric unit. It's called tor. And one millimeter of mercury is called one tor. Sometimes in weather maps, when they're doing, um, like mapping out air pressure to predict the forecast, they'll use tors. Anything that goes into the 600s, they call that hurricane time. Yeah. When it drops below. 700 millimeters of mercury or 700 tors, then you can anticipate some bad weather. One atmosphere is also measured in pascals, and typically, here's our SI unit for pressure. We use kilopascals instead because writing this number, 101,325, is pretty awkward. So we memorized last year 101.3 kPa's is one atmosphere. I'm just going to give my AP Chem students a few more sig figs so that they can be more precise in their calculations. 101.325 kPa's is equal to one atmosphere. So knowing how to convert between these units is going to be pretty important. And we're just going to put them into our t-table using the equals sign. Remember, in a t-table to convert units, you can put one number above the other as long as those numbers are equal. So one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Since these numbers are equal to one another, then this fraction is equal to one. You can multiply anything by one without changing its quantity. So that's why t-tables are so useful. My students are used to doing this. So I'm not going to spend any more time explaining why. We're just going to do one. So we have a question. What is 724 millimeters of mercury in kPa's? That's the first part of the question. So you're going to run the calculator for us? Yes. All right. We're going to start with what they've given us and go to the target that they ask us to do. So we'll start with 724 millimeters of mercury. And then our conversion factor is going to put one thing on top of the other. Crisscross cancels. So millimeters of mercury goes on the bottom this time. And I want to change it into kPa's. So that's what I put on top. And it was 101.3. And now that we're big kids in AP Chem, we're going to use 101.325 kPa's is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So we multiply the top times the top and then divide by the bottom. And our calculator magic says 96.525. Did you want three? Yep, give, give me some more. Five, three, nine, four, seven. There's a whole bunch of calculator vomit there. All right, so <laughs> millimeters of mercury cancels away, and we're left with units of kPa's. Remember, 101.3 is equal to one atmosphere, right? Right. This is less than one atmosphere. So let's check with our millimeters of mercury. 760 is one atmosphere. This is less. So we're getting an answer that seems reasonable. Right. Okay. Now let's look at our sig figs. I had three sig figs in this number. So when I'm looking at my answer, I have to stop after the 5. So the 2 is not big enough to make us round up. We'll just call it 96.5 kilopascals and put a box around your answer because that's the way I like it. All right, so we answered the first part of the question. Now let's do the second part of the question. What is 724 millimeters of mercury in Tor? Okay, so we could set this up in a T table. 724 millimeters of mercury, where we know that one millimeter of mercury is equal to one tor. Hopefully, though, my students are clever enough to have already figured this out, that you don't have to show your work on this one. That was some easy math. <laughs> yeah. Is that what your calculator told us? Oh, yes. Absolutely. All right. Very good.
Good thing she used the calculator in her brain, because if you do this on your calculator in class, we will make fun of you, I promise. <laughs> All right, in atmospheres, we expect to get something less than one atmosphere. So let's start with 724 millimeters of mercury, and we're going to change this to atmospheres. 760 millimeters of mercury goes on the bottom, and one atmosphere goes on the top. I have too many bumps in that M. Whoa, got a little out of control. <laughs> okay, so basically 724 divided by 760. Mm, 0.95263. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we could keep going, but there's no need because we get to keep only... Um, Three cyclics. So point nine five. We better round up this time, yeah. Yes. Atmospheres. And so it is indeed less than one atmosphere. That's what we anticipated. So we're gonna always check and, and make sure that the answer our calculator gives us is something reasonable for the problem that we're doing. Just because your calculator says so doesn't mean it's right. Okay, I think that's it for this podcast. So hey, we are on the last slide. So we will do some more of these practice problems in your homework and in class, but not very many because you guys are masters at this already. See you later.